So uh, welcome to my talk, Debug C++ Without Running. Uh, my name is Anastasia Katakova. I work for JetBrains. We do tools for developers, so mostly IDs and team tools as well. Uh, but this talk is not about our tools in particular. I will be mentioning them as a part of the ecosystem, but if you would like to learn about the tools, come to our booth. That's the place where we promote the tools. This is more a general talk about C++ and its ecosystem. And the idea behind is that I'm not gonna talk about the classical debugging process at all. I'm gonna talk about how to unveil the complicated C++ abstractions which we currently have in the modern standards, in the modern code base, without even compiling or running a preprocessor in your code. How you can do that in the modern tooling, which capabilities you have and which we still miss, and I'll a little bit dream about some possible additions that we might have in the future. Um, so yeah, first of all, we'll start with some pre-K C++ examples and we'll discuss why the classical uh, way doesn't work here and then we'll look at what the capabilities modern IDEs currently provide here. So let's start about why this talk actually. So we all here uh, know that, like Sam said, that C++ is a complicated language and actually it is. And if you ask some particular developers from some particular areas about C++, you can learn a lot about the C++ complexity. Like for example, if you take game developers, uh, when they want to create a game, the usual path for them is just take everything, put it into one folder, run Unity on top and get a game, job done. You can earn money, you can be happy and uh, whatever. But if you want something more complicated, you run into some uh, Unreal Engine or some custom C++ engines for game developers. They're quite complicated, but all the AAA games are usually using them, not the Unity things. And this is the things that frightens many developers, especially if they would like to start with the game developer. They most likely will start with Unity, not the Unreal Engine or some custom uh, game engines. Embedded, embedded is still in C mostly, like embedded developers who are actually doing C++, that's just so little part of them. So mostly because they get used to it, there is a lot of legacy code, and the C++ is kind of a complicated abstractions for them. And <coughs> I will show later that the modern service shows that people are still using C++11 and C++14 a little bit. The C++17 is growing, but we're far away from it right now. Uh, but I like the current trend in the C++ ecosystem in general, that the people are trying to explain that the modern instructions, uh, they, they are fine, so we can deal with them. We just need to find a proper way how to work with them. And as usually, I put this nice quote to my talks, and I like it a lot. And it's not about the thing that C++ is that uh, complicated, but as Pierre explains on that page, is that that's actually true for all powerful languages. Because um, when the language protects you from simple dangers, you can actually get into harder problems easier because you don't expect them. You are thinking about simpler pro problems. Uh, and sometimes hard problems, they might be discovered too late when there is no remedy for them. And that's a story about the C++ actually. This year in April, I was at ACC conference in Bristol and some people came to our JetBrains booth there, we have their booth as well. So, and they said to me that, but developers should suffer. Uh, thinking about that the C++ developers should actually suffer to provide better code, but Yes, probably, because we then become more thoughtful on our code, we think more about it, we become more accurate, but should we really suffer, all of us? Could we just deal with the C++ in some easier way? And if we take a look at some surveys, so this data is from the developer ecosystem survey. We run in uh, JetBrains yearly, so we took it in 2017 and in the beginning of 2018, so two times uh, in row already. And we got some data for C++ developers as well. So in 2017, they were only 1,700 C++ developers who uh, actually passed the survey. In 2018, they were already 4,700 C++ developers who passed the survey. So I could expect these results to be kind, uh, quite representative. And as you see actually, so on this picture, so what's, um, what's actually going on there, so 
this is the most huge part and this is C++11. Then goes like C++14 and uh, like C++17 is a very small part over there. So here it is, C++17. This is the standard signed up a couple of years ago. The committee is now signing up the C++20. It will be finally uh, prepared uh, during the winter meeting. So it's nearly closed from the future adoption. So, and at the same time, the people are still using some old standards. They are still not moved to C++17, and some of them still not moved to C++14. Good figures actually here is that the people are planning to move to a new standard. We do ask this in our survey. So are you planning to move to a new standard? They do plan, but uh, mostly these are those people who are moving from C++98 and other old standards here in the beginning of the graph. Um, yeah, let's look at another survey. So this is the C++ Foundation survey. So this is the official survey run by the C++ Foundation, ISO CPP, and it's promoted via isocpp.com uh, site, and like their channels. So this is the survey they also took at the beginning of 2018. And so, like, same numbers actually here. So you can see that these are the C++ uh, 98, yeah, so, and here is actually the C++17 in the bottom. And so green is that the people are using the features from the standard. Blue is that they're using uh, some uh, features partially, so just some selected features. And yellow is that the standard is not allowed. So, and you see that nearly half of the developers said that C++17 is not allowed their place of work. Um, and yeah, I forgot to say that this survey actually collected 3,200 replies, so also quite representative, and it more or less correlates with what we got in the developer ecosystem survey. And this cloud here is actually uh, is the answer taken from the question about why, what is the difficulty with staying uh, abraced with the new features in the standard. So why are not adapting the new standards? And that was the answer. So, and you can see the words here like difficulty, difficulty to understand, and like new stuff, practices, and some names of the particular features. And it seems to me that for many developers, more than C++ is very complicated. And there are different, different opinions in the community. Some people think that uh, the standard uh, actually evolves quite quickly, even too quick and some things that it evolves too slow. <laughs> and yeah, both, both opinion can live together. And just a simple example here. So this is a nice code example we got while testing the C-Line IDE brains. It was generated by our QA engineer. So she was playing with a particular language feature which was supported in the tool. So she was just generating some examples, uh, looking at how C-Line actually treats them. And that was the example where the slide actually was broken, and so she reported an issue to the developer. And the developer took a look at the sample, and his reasonable question was, what's, why this sample? What's behind that? What's the reason? So what it actually does? And we started looking at this nice code example. In, it's fully compilable. It's nice and more than C++. But let's try and guess what it's actually doing. So you can see that there is some variable template happening here. So we put it, as usual, we put it to the compiler explorer. That's the usual thing we do with every piece of C++ code we deal with. So uh, Matt Godbolt usually does a good job for us, showing us the disassemble code, but that actually doesn't help a lot. So we, we saw some code, it was doing some, uh, some actions, but didn't make much sense uh, in trying to understand what the example actually means. So then we decided to transform it a bit. So uh, first of all, we wrote the variable uh, template in some other syntax. Then we removed it completely, and then we removed the cast. And we end up in a sample that's just print returning 42. That's actually all what this code actually means. So this kind of complicated sample in the beginning just returns 42. And that's the story about the modern C++. You can actually write kind of compilable code using some modern features, but they 
might have no sense at all in your particular code. So you might end up in just returning the 42 behind all these variable templates. Um, this made us think that something goes wrong sometimes when we write C++ code. But we have, apart from these like template things, modern things, we have some background coming from the macros. We have them, we have to deal with them. So Pierre Strauss group at CppCon this year said that that's the only thing he actually uh, thinks which is very bad for C++ and he would like to get rid of it. But we still have it. That's our kind of heritage which we have to deal nowadays. And if we look at the example, so what's going on here? I have a macro uh, and I have some file, some text file, xmacro.txt, where I just have some some text, so it's not even a, uh, like C++ code, so they're just a text. And so I define a macro, and then I include a file, construct some enum, and then undefine the macro. So after the macro is undefined, I have no traces at all of what was going on there, so what actually generated some enum for me. I don't know the values of this enum because they are actually not in this file, so I just have enum and then something happening uh, inside this define. So how can I get the possible values? I'm happy enough if I can just generate this uh, switch case operator, and then these values could be generated, some tools can do that, uh, then I'm safe, but if I don't have this possibility, so I have to track what are the actual values, how they look like to actually write this switch case operator. Um, okay, so another example with the macro is that I can define nearly everything. So that's just a text substitution uh, before the preprocessing step. So before I run the preprocessor, I saw I can see some code like this, and actually what it, this code does for me, it defines a class. There are some uh, members in this class, some functions, and I actually don't see the proper class definition, proper function definition here before I go into the actual macro. So this could be placed in a different file in some library, so I have to go there to navigate to see what's the actual code. And it could be complicated, it could include several steps, like here I have two macros, but I can have more. And so I have to go whole path to understand what this actual code here means to me. Or I have like to process to see the result. Uh, another example here is a nice context-dependent example. So I have this foo.h file where I have this template, uh, or if the magic value has different value here, I have this uh, definition for x. So x is either uh, a templated uh, constructor or it's just an integer. And so in foo.cpp, in the last line where I have this K, this is actually either an expression or a template instantiation. So it's either a type or just a uh, expression there. And it fully changed the meaning of this line of code to me. And it actually depends on this fantastic magic value which can come from the compilation uh, compiler parameters so I can provide it at the compilation step compiling the code with one or another branch. So to understand the code in foo.cpp, I have actually to understand which magic value I'm gonna use, so it's, if it's defined, so and which branch I'm actually taking here. That's a complicated path we have to recreate in our mind if we would like to understand the meaning of the code before actually compiling it. And you know the C++ committee would like more in that direction. We are currently discussing the reflection in the language, the compile time generation, and finally, as the piece of cake in the end, we'll probably get the meta classes from Herb Sutter, which will work in the following way. So this is just an example from Herb Sutter's proposal. So you get this interface shape defined in your code. This is the meta class, which is placed somewhere in your code or in a standard library if it got the meta classes as well. And this is the code that's got generated for you during the compile time, so you don't see it. So actually to guess which methods you get for this shape, you have to understand what is this matter class interface uh, inside. 
And if that's just a part of a standard library, you should go to some standard library definition, find it out there, and realize what this shape is. So I would call, following the herb setter, these things are professional hiders. So they hide the actual values value of your code. There is another example of this kind, which is overloads. It's not a very complicated thing like operator overload or function overload. But guess what? In C++, we can overload nearly everything, so we can overload a single operator like plus. So when you see a plus, you don't know if it's a plus or if it's doing something else. And here, for example, in this example, if you take this line from the fraction example, which I the STD out, so actually half of the stream output operator are more or less standard, so taken from the standard library, and half of them are actually overloaded for my fraction class here. So yeah. So this is the fraction class, and this is the operator I'm overloading. So in this uh, last line in the fraction example, so half of the operators are standard, half are overloaded. But they look the same. Um, nearly the same story with the function overload. So the function overload algorithm, it's not complicated. So you just need to do that. It's just long, and it takes a lot of parameters uh, as an input. So here in this example, actually, the result will be printing two and two. And to get that, you have to actually handle all these uh, overload set candidates, uh, throw away those which doesn't fit, build the overload set, the candidate set, then filter it uh, to taking a look at some uh, privacy or deleted um, nodes. And you can calculate it in your mind. It's just takes some time, and that means it takes your precious time while you're writing the code to understand which actual overloads is taken. And if you made a mistake, the code can be still compilable, but you'll get just some unpredictable results in the end. Um, and there is actually much more, like all these constacts per story, all these injections in the reflection, that's all the things that are professional hiders. That's how I call them. Um, so let's assume we would like to still stay on a track and to understand what's there behind this code we have on a screen. So what we can do, we can go uh, into a classical uh, cycle of like compiling, testing and debugging, or maybe printing some values out of your code and editing the code and then compiling it back. The problem is here that, first of all, the compilation could take a long time. We don't want to wait until the compilation actually passes. Sometimes to get the actual result from your program, you need to deploy it to a board, to some embedded device, whatever. You don't want to do that to understand uh, the meaning of your code. And actually the target platform could be different from the platform where you're actually running your IDE, so that might be an issue as well. And also the code could be incomplete, so they might be just a library. So to understand the code in the library, you actually have to implement some code example or some test using this library to see what, what's actually going on in this library. That's not what we actually would like to do to be kind of productive with the code. And also, there might be just all these like static or dynamic code analyzers, they might catch some issues, but maybe we don't have any issues. We just try to understand the flow in logic or just try to understand the actual code there and we don't want to build it and to run it to understand it. We would like just to read it and to understand what's behind this code. Like 20 years ago or maybe 15 years ago in C++, it was much easier than now. So my answer is that this doesn't always help. And actually, as a quick step out here, uh, thanks to Herb Sardo, who was actually the person from whom I started this, thinking about this talk. So he made a talk about first on generative C++ at uh, CppCon 2017. And he actually said these things, that the abstractions in the language, they are hiders, and that the abstractions need some tool support so that the developers could understand the actual meaning behind the abstraction. And the good abstraction do need to be toolable. 
And that's the problem in the modern C++ language development that sometimes uh, people in the committee don't think about how toolable the abstraction could be actually. And the good thing is that the C++ committee, they now have the tooling evolution group, which was created especially for taking a look at such cases when they create some abstraction in the language which might not be really toolable for, for the tools who would like to support that. And as you see, if the tool doesn't support the abstraction in the proper way, that means that the people won't be using it because the people, they are still the developers who are still using the all the standards and we won't move to the new standard which hides actually more actual code from us, more actual uh, meaning from us. And this is also a slide from the Herb's talk which I do treat as a nice feature request to all tooling vendors because he was just listing all the features coming to the language uh, from, the, from C to C++ 17, um, explaining what we actually need to to understand the meaning of these abstractions. Okay, so now let's see what we can actually do. Uh, let's start with the macro debug. So the goal of the macro debugging is actually uh, trying to understand the substitution without even running the preprocessor, because the preprocessor step could be long. Uh, so we would like just to look at the code and understand what's going on there. Um, so there are actually a couple of uh, tools available which could help you. So first of all, uh, the tool can show you the final replacement. This is the screenshot taken from the uh, C line. So it shows you the uh, final replacement in the quick documentation pop-up like that. So you just get the formatted output for your Mac substitution, the final substitution after all the included macro was substituted. And so you can just call it and get the actual uh, value behind the line. Um, another uh, way to deal with the macros could be just try and debug it in some way without actually calling the debugger. So this is the way that we implemented in ReSharper C++. So we provided an option to, uh, let me call it, unwind the stack. So you can substitute the next macro. Uh, so just call an action that substitutes the next step for the macro. So here I'm just substituting uh, the next step for, for my macro. So you see that the function uh, is not, uh, the function definition is not yet substituted, but the class definition was substituted. So this is good because you can stop at any point. So for example, guess you have a very long boost macro or some cute macro. So you can just unwind the step stack step by step, stop at any point, change something uh, on your way, so just when you realize that something goes wrong or you would like to try another path here. And sometimes you even don't need a final replacement, so unwinding the stack step by step might be even better than showing the final replacement to you because the final replacement, for example, for boost is just a huge number of lines and it doesn't make sense all the time. Sometimes you just need a two steps uh, uh, from this step. Uh, from this tag. So, but I would like to say that here you have to be very careful. In a couple of minutes I will explain why, because as always with the macros, the context matters. So before I go to these context issues, so uh, I can say that you still can substitute all the steps in ReSharper C++ just in your actual code. So this is just the substitution of all the steps so to unwind your stack uh, up to the very end. And kind of practical example here is uh, about the boost macros. So the, I have a boost pp repeat macro over here. So I can substitute it step by step. So unwinding the stack and in the end I will get this value here or I can just substitute uh, all up to the very end with one action. Um, as I said, the context matters. Let's look at the example. So I have this uh, uvar macros, set of macros, and they are actually using the counter macro. And uh, along with the line macro, it's one of the most awful macros in the C++ and C world, I guess, because they are, they, they, they are actually dependent on the context. So if I substitute the second uvar usage, I'll get this line, so I'll get the substitution, so I have v1 variable defined, and now you see that I actually got this uh, red squizzles under the last usage of the new var macro. 
And so because the proper tooling, which actually parses the code for me, uh, it can see that I have uh, doubled definition here. So I have two v, uh, v1 variables declared here because now the counter for the last line is again one. So it's zero, one, two, but after my substitution, it got uh, zero and one for the last line. So the code doesn't compile right now. And I could have these lines spread along the, so here they're just uh, one after another, they, but they could be spread in a long function across several pages of code. So you should be careful about these things because when you substitute the macro, the context changes. And this actually the things that usually happens to Unreal Engine developers in game industry because they have like every, game dev developers in C++, every engine for C++ developers uh, in the game area, they're implementing the reflection which we still miss in the C++ language. And the Unreal Engine actually implements reflection on top of macros. And they use the line counters inside. So every reasonable class in Unreal Engine code actually marked with a U-class macro which, have a, which has a line macro inside. And so when you type some, some code before class, everything just breaks in the editor, and you have to run the Unreal header build tool to make the code built correctly and make it resolved correctly. Um, so yeah, so this, this was about the context. Another command about the context is that sometimes macro substitutions are quite complicated because macro is just a text substitution and not all the tool uh, can deal with it correctly. So this is the example that actually breaks in every known to me uh, C++ editor, every known to me C++ IDE. So when you uh, put a cursor to the function M definition here on the func and try to go to declaration from this symbol, uh, you will see the following output. So you'll get two options. One func from the first line, one func from the second line, but what it's actually missing, it's missing this one. And no modern IDE can deal with that because this code could be placed somewhere deep in your, in your code base. So no one actually searches through the whole code base for just a text substitution. It takes long, lots of time and you'll wait for this go to declaration pop up for ages. So they just skip it. But you have to be careful because it still could be there. Um, okay, so let's move to type debugging. So type debugging is actually understanding the final type. Again, in the same way as I would like to deal with the macros, I would like to look at the type and to understand the type uh, which is actually happening behind for this variable or uh, for this call. So this is an example uh, which you can write in more than C++. It doesn't have any single type in this piece of code. So I just have some auto and decal type and I have a definition for a do operation function and I call it with some values. And the actual type for the op variable is inferred from this actual call, from the parameters which I pass to the do operation. So most of the modern IDEs nowadays could cope with that. If you call some window which calls like quick documentation in case of JetBrains IDEs and some like other pop-ups for so this is, these are the screenshots from Visual Studio Eclipse and C-Line. So you can see that they inferred the type double for you correctly. So if you put the two integers as, a, as an argument, you'll get the integer there and so on and so forth. So this is quite easy for, for IDEs, so because the IDEs usually build the whole AST, so they can actually understand the meaning of the code. And they can actually understand the actual types. They are inferring them on the fly, so we'll get this immediately. That's easy. Okay, uh, more complicated example. So let me guess that I'm trying to deal with some creepy boost MPL macros. And I would like to understand some actual types. And I would like to understand the type of the high variable in the very last line, which is defined like that. Uh, to do that, uh, I can either be really proficient with boost macros, or uh, as I'm not really proficient with them, uh, I can try and debug them in some way. So in ReSharp C++, what we can do, we can substitute uh, a type def 
going one step uh, in the stack. So the same way we're unwinding the stack for the macros, we can try and unwind the stack for the types. So you can see that I got the NAC substitution here. And after like several substitutions, or if I ask to substitute the final type, uh, I'll get the final type for my high variable, which is just D there. Uh, so it again looks like a proper debugging process, but it just doesn't uh, recall any kind of a debugger. Just try to understand the type substituting the next step. So you can like call the undo and advine everything back in your code. Uh, another example is trying to understand the type information is actually instantiating the templates. So when instantiating the templates, it would be nice to understand what I'm actually instantiating, what are the types I've passed, what's the actual function that, that was called. And in that sense, uh, modern RDs could do some job for you. So here are these screenshots from CVALP, Eclipse, and C++. So uh, if you look at it properly, so here is the Eclipse. So it just shows you that uh, the, the function signature which actually was used in that, uh, in that case. So if you call, call it for the third handle, you get the third overload. If you call it for the uh, second handle, you get the second overload, so on and so forth. So you get the function signature, the body, and the command. Um, and yeah, the same, like th this is actually the Visual Studio, so you'll get this, uh, Again, the function uh, signature and the command. And in CVELOP, which is kind of a little bit a university project, but still some nice addition built on top of the Eclipse, uh, they provide this nice view when you can get several windows showing you how the t uh, templates were instantiated. And you can see that they just write uh, what was used as the actual types in your uh, function signature, so you can go for it. Here's just a small screenshot, but they can build a chain of the instantiation, so you can look at this chain. This is a very nice feature, I think. Uh, let's trim a little bit. So, um, while talking about the const text per evaluation, so I would like to understand what, what the actual branch uh, is gonna be here without actually compiling the code. So in the ideal world, while uh, navigating from this get value usage, I would like to see the proper branch here highlighted. Um, somewhere in the past, kdevelop had a very nice feature. When you were navigating from the template and satiation, it was providing the uh, code intelligence based on the actual instantiation from where you came from. They dropped the feature after introducing the Clang D based engine, the Clang, sorry, the Lip Clang engine. So that's the typical story for those who are moving to the Clang because it's a nice uh, language engine but still not powerful enough for many features. So that's not available in the KDevelop uh, anymore, but that indeed was a very nice feature. And I would like to see it here, like you just navigate from the get value and see the proper branch highlighted. Uh, but there is some movement in this direction. This is the let me see if I can play this. Yeah, so this is the uh, screencast of the Visual Studio feature called Template IntelliSense, which they introduced recently. They showed it on Build conference in spring, then they showed that on CppCon uh, during this fall. So what it actually does, so they have this nice UI in the uh, Visual Studio editor. You just provide there the types you're gonna use for instantiating the template, because usually we know the list of types we're gonna use for the instantiation. I don't believe we write the template just for everything. So you just provide the types which you're most likely gonna use there, and then the completion starts working using this type as the basement. So you have some intelligence inside the template, template body, just providing these uh, types manually. Um, okay, let's move forward. So talking about the <coughs> overloads, like operator overloads and function overloads, could we debug them? Uh, we've implemented this kind of feature for c -Lion, trying to help people to distinguish overloaded operators. So you see here that I put a cursor on my stream output operator and not all of them were actually highlighted. Just because while I put a cursor here, 
it got said this is the overload operator and it's highlighted me uh, all the overload operators including this uh, overload here. So, and you can actually find all the usages of the overload operator. You can navigate to the actual definition of this, like to the actual overload and to see what actually is doing. So, this is about the operators. Can we do something for functions? This is the part which miss a lot of uh, stuff on the tools actually, because uh, the overload resolution, as I said, it's a very straightforward process. It just requires some efforts and like some time from you and some thinking. So you just have to do some lookup and build a set and filter it properly. Um, currently, what the actual tooling uh, does for us as a C++ developers, it usually just shows us the whole, uh, whole overload set considered sometimes uh, highlighted in some way so when the overload uh, option doesn't fit so it can highlight it in gray if it's smart enough. So this is the uh, Visual Studio so they just have all the overloads and you can just list through them just clicking these buttons. This is the C line which just shows you the set of possible uh, arguments which were considered. Um, in uh, Eclipse and so in the Eclipse they actually show the whole function signature and in ReSharper C++ we do show the whole function signature and the documentation command which sometimes is helpful to understand what this actual function is. So but that's actually all we have. So we have the candidate set either with the just a set of parameters or with the uh, full signatures shown to you, but we don't have any explanation on like why this particular candidate didn't fit or why it was selected. Uh, I would really love to have this in the tooling. Uh, we were thinking about it for a while in JetBrains. We didn't came up with some nice solution how to do that, but I think this is the thing that all the tool vendors have to implement, so just showing you why the proper overload um, candidate was selected. In ReSharp C++, we recently implemented in the error annotator, we implemented the thing that tried to explain you why the uh, overload uh, candidate didn't fit in case of error. So if you have no proper candidate selected and if there is some error, so ReSharp C++ can highlight and try to show you the condition that was uh, not fulfilled, like if you got the is constructible not fulfilled or something else, so which helps in case you have some enable if with many, many conditions inside. So this is probably the thing that concept will ad concepts will address. So when you have some concepts and the tools uh, can show you which concepts were not fulfilled. But before that, we have just enable if, and uh, if we talk about the compilers like GCC and MSVC, they really failed well, tried to show you a proper error. So Clang is doing a better job than others. So it actually tries to show as uh, the most reasonable information about the error. So MSVC and GCC usually just say that it failed. So not very helpful actually. Um, yeah, and another demo here is actually, this is the prototype that's not a real production feature, but that's just a prototype which we implement and that which is actually possible to do in the tooling uh, in terms of overload. So guess you have uh, some functions and you change some signature, uh, but you still would like to navigate to the uh, proper definition, for example. So you can do that because you changed the function signature and you broke some code, but the tool, they actually could try and get you to some similar functions using some heuristics. That's actually more or less possible, so we proved that with this proof of concept, which is just a kind of a toy, toy feature we implemented for just our internal use. Okay, so that was about debugging macros, type defs, and overloads and templates. And the last thing I would like to talk here is a very important thing, maybe not directly connected to unveiling the abstractions, but very important in terms of uh, understanding the uh, code, your, your actual code base, which you see on the screen. And back in 2011, there was this nice article uh, which was called uh, like uh, Karen uh, by Sharon Hatter Hero. And they were talking about 
the situation with the products, when the product grows, when you develop it for one, two, three, five years, the number of includes also grows. And sometimes it's an unreasonable growth. So because we just add includes, we don't care what they actually are using inside each other, we just add an include because we know we need it. And this actually leads to a situation when we have a very long compilation time. No one knows which are, what, what is actually happening inside this code because it has too many includes. And why on earth we are all using all these includes, no one can answer. And there is this blow up factor which you can calculate from your code, which is the total lines divided by the total lines of code parsed after all the substitution. And it sometimes could be a very freaking number. So how to deal with that? There is an obvious thing, use the precompiled headers. But to do that, we have to put something to this precompiled header entity, build it, and then reuse it. Sometimes it's not a very easy thing to do. Sometimes we can't actually afford that because we still have to change something in the header files. Um, another thing which we can do is just try to investigate what we are actually including, trying to understand why. Uh, in uh, Resharper C++, we implemented the thing called includes profiler, includes analyzer, where we just build a view with all the files from your project, trying to show you uh, the number of line, lines in each files and number of lines inclusive, which means with all the includes substitutions. So you can just sort it by the biggest one in this list and try to guess if you actually have it uh, due to some good reason. So you can see what you are actually including and try to find out. Um, but that's just an option for you to review the current state. Uh, another step will be just to look for those includes which are actually unused. This is possible. Quite many tools nowadays can highlight you the unused includes. So, and then you can go and remove them or either manually or automatically. So some tools provide you some includes optimizers. <coughs> and there is a very popular tool called include what you use, which uh, Google somehow promotes and they say that it helps them to improve the compilation time by 40%, which is huge. Like 40% is like one third of the compilation time. And what it actually does is try to remove unnecessary includes and replace the includes with the forward declarations. So breaking some unuseful, uh, useless connections. And the very similar functionality is available in Eclipse and it's called an includator plugin, so which does nearly the same. Um, I'm not sure how they compare to each other. Uh, the people to whom I talk mostly use the include what you use. And actually there is two sides of this problem here. So because many uh, IDEs nowadays, they can add includes while you are starting using some symbol, like you're starting using something and the IDE suggests you to add an include. The problem is that quite often the easiest way to add an include breaks the include what you use concept because the include what you use concept means when you have a symbol A defined in the header B, but it's included in the header A, include the header A. But the most of the tools will include the header B for you. And that's probably another thing we have to, to address in the tooling world, like try to match our automatic imports with include what you use concept because it seems reasonable enough. Um, yeah, so and that's actually mostly it. So there are a couple of useful links if we, you would like to follow up with the surveys I was talking here about or to read this nice article about the header hero or to watch the Herb Sutter's talk about the efforts on generative C++. So you can just, yeah, grab these links and uh, go further. So, and that's it. So, questions? Where's the brave one? <laughs> Okay, so you can come later to me. I'm still here for today and tomorrow. You can find me at the booth. You can come and talk about the tools or just about the talk or any stuff about the C++ you would like to. So thank you very much for your attention.